a lot of times when you consider artificial intelligence services and solutions, they're often synonymous with the public cloud. And there's this notion that you need sometimes hundreds to thousands of GPUs to run AI services. And what we're seeing start to emerge with smaller AI models is that on-premises solutions are uh, starting to really pick up steam as well uh, for the benefit of things like lower cost, uh, better security and privacy, being able to preserve control of your data sources and things like that. Now, if we step back and talk about hybrid architectures, there's a new pattern we're also seeing emerge, which is maybe I'm going to use the, that pure on-demand and raw compute capacity of the public cloud to train an AI service or train an AI model, but then I might deploy it on infrastructure that I control so I can have more predictive costs and things like that. So there, we see a mix, and, and this is going to be very situational. So sometimes, like for example, marketing content where I'm creating public-facing content A-OK, -okay, no problem using some just vertically oriented AI services and solutions for those, but for content where I might want to maintain more privacy and control of my data, a little bit more flexibility and take a platform approach, that's where we're seeing private AI really start to take shape. And I just want to double click on the platform approach real quick because internally we, we operate a lot of our own IT services, our AI services at Broadcom. And by taking a platform approach, what we're able to do is build a, a, an abstraction layer for AI infrastructure so as new models, as new services come along, we can quickly onboard them via software. And that's a really powerful construct, we feel, in terms of maintaining flexibility and agility while at the same time preserving control of your data. I see these architectures as more complementary, and we think that's going to continue to evolve that way. You know, whether it's uh, leveraging a cloud for training or whether in leveraging a cloud for very specific services, we think that's uh, we think that's very organic and natural in how organizations will consume artificial intelligence services, and then you're, you're seeing this uh, construct where you can start to bring services on premises as well and bring them closer to your data, and that's been even core to our strategy is to have a number of partnerships where we can bring services in uh, that can then run on a, a shared platform and offer choice to customers. The way we look at private AI is it's not necessarily a product. Private AI we consider to be an architectural approach to delivering AI services. And what you're trying to do is maintain the privacy and security and compliance gain that you might have for an enterprise organization, but I want to balance that with the benefits of AI. So if I put it simply, private AI is about bringing the AI model to wherever your data sources happen to be. And then I can start to, when I do that, and I have the model adjacent to my data, I can do things like A-B test models. I can find what is the best model for a particular use case quite effectively. And then as new tools and models emerge, I can very quickly swap them out. So that's what, that's what we see is really key. And, and I think it's also worth mentioning that you don't need hundreds of GPUs to gain the benefits of private AI. One of our most important internal services that we operate is running on four GPUs today. So there's a lot that you can do with actually a small amount of resources and be very successful. There's a lot of open source in AI in general. So some of the models that we're running internally today are open source models. Uh, they're smaller, they're domain specific. They consume uh, less resources because they're a smaller model. They then have a lower carbon footprint and need lower power to your racks of services. So just that, that aspect of AI evolution we think is really important. Now you also see other aspects of open source as well. So for example, above our platform, we leverage a Kubernetes API. So that really makes the interop for customers quite simple. And one last example I'll leave you with is the Ray project. So Ray is a very popular open source project that we consider to be uh, the Kubernetes of artificial intelligence. Uh, just like Kubernetes helps you to manage and orchestrate containers, we're seeing the same thing with the Ray project for AI applications and helping you to scale that, not just say on-premises, but across different clouds in whatever scenario a uh, customer is looking for. So there's a lot of traction in, in open source that's creating more flexibility and more interoperability uh, for organizations to take advantage of AI use cases. Yeah, we see a very robust hardware ecosystem around AI today. And what really helps from a customer perspective is you have additional open source projects such as PyTorch that provide a neutral AI framework that is open source that has connectors to lots of different hardware accelerators. So we see a fairly healthy ecosystem here. And keep in mind, VMware as a company was a company born here at Stanford. And VMware has always been about creating a virtualization layer for hardware interop. 
that's still the key function and the key value we drive. And it's not just VMware. There's lots of other virtualization type companies that are providing the same value. So you can gain the benefits of AI and still have a lot of flexibility and in interop that you can achieve via software. Yeah, so workload mobility to me is about being able to maybe build an application in one place, but then be able to execute or run that application in other places. And that's key for businesses because I might start an application in the cloud, but now all of a sudden I have this edge use case and I need to run maybe a part of that application somewhere else. So investing in solutions that provide mobility is really key. That could be using container-based technologies and using tools like Kubernetes. It could be using virtualization software like we provide that can offer you that type of flexibility. And again, using AI frameworks in the context of AI that allow that AI runtime, say, to execute anywhere, that also can help to uh, promote mobility from an architectural perspective. And when we look at what is the role of the government, and to me, there's been great work that's happened in the past couple of years. So if you look at the president's executive order on artificial intelligence, there's a lot of really good constructs in there around explainability, around privacy, around resiliency of AI systems. And these are all things that we've been driving with private AI prior to the executive order. Uh, having flexibility to be able to deploy different models and being able to run different AI services uh, using a neutral type of platform. So these are areas that we've already invested in. And then if you look at the NIST guidelines, that's really focused on safety and security of artificial intelligence. So the government in the US is on the right track in terms of uh, promoting safe and secure artificial intelligence without impeding the progress of innovation because we're a global leader in the space. And then if I was to think about, you know, what can the government do more? The government often invests quite a bit in innovation, but doesn't invest enough in adoption. So incentivizing first movers and incentivizing agencies where a CIO is looking for a peer agency to say, oh, well, how, who else has already had success? That's gonna go a long way to promoting more adoption going forward, in my opinion.